Hi, everyone. Welcome to this special Bastille Day edition of the How Have I Not Read This Book Club, partnering with eShaver Booksellers of Savannah, Georgia. We hope that if you don't already have a copy of A Year in Provence or any of Peter Mayle's other books, or I might add Martin Walker's books, that you might think about ordering copies from eShavers. Uh, my name is James Meter with Knopf Doubleday Publishing Group, part of Penguin Random House. If you'll bear with me, I have just a couple housekeeping items to touch on before I introduce you to our speakers and turn the rest of the hour over to them and to you. So if you'd like to submit questions for our speakers, and we certainly hope you will, you can do so by using the Q&A module, which should be available at the bottom of your screen. You can upvote questions submitted by others as well. Just activate the Zoom chat, which should also be at the bottom of your screen, and comment along with the conversation. We suggest uh, toggling your chat from all panelists, which is the default, unhelpfully, to all panelists and attendees, which will make your comments available to the whole group and then maybe bring on some conversation. Uh, now I'm going to ask our speakers to start their microphones and their cameras and come onto the digital stage. And while they get settled, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, who will then introduce the rest of the program. Uh, it gives me a lot of pleasure to introduce my colleague, Jonathan Siegel. John is vice president and executive editor at Alfred A. Knopf, where he has worked since 1989. Prior to that, he worked for Simon & Schuster and for the New York Times. Among many honors, in 2015, he was presented the Editorial Excellence Award by the Biographers International Organization. Seven books that he has edited have been awarded Pulitzer Prizes, and the list of remarkable authors with whom he's worked includes, I'm very pleased to say, both Peter Mayle and our guest, Martin Walker. John, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, James. So sweet of you. Thank you very much, and welcome, everyone. Uh, it, uh, it's just happy Bastille Day to everyone, and no better way for me to celebrate it than to talk about Peter Mayle. Um, Joining me today are going to be uh, Peter's widow, Jenny Mail. Uh, Jenny married Peter in London in uh, March of 1982. Uh, they moved to Provence in 1985. Um, lived in Provence for, I think, 26 years uh, so far. And Jenny's uh, pictures of, uh, of Peter graced every jacket uh, uh, of every one of Peter's books. Uh, welcome to Jenny. Um, Martin Walker, who lives one hour north of me, uh, was a correspondent for a long time uh, for The Guardian. He worked in unimportant places like Moscow and Washington, DC. And he's written many works of uh, books of, of fiction as well as nonfiction and the, the fiction mostly consists of his wonderful series of books on Bruno, Chief of Police. Uh, I'm sitting in my home in the southwest of France. As I said, Martin is one hour north of me, door to door, sitting in his beloved Perigord, and Jenny is in Provence. So welcome to everyone. There's Jenny. How are you? I'm, I'm delighted to see you. I'm very well, thank you. It's been good. It's good to see you. And Martin's with us. Hi. Uh, it's good to see you, Jonathan. I'm uh, sorry we couldn't get it together yesterday, um, but um, uh, it's very good to see you, at least electronically. And Jenny, <laughs> very, very nice to meet you. I mean, it, like everybody who's read, uh, who's read Peter's books, I feel I sort of knew you at second hand anyway, from uh, having shared bits of your life. <laughs> so it's nice to see you in the flesh, or at least electronic flesh. <laughs> the electronic flesh. Uh, Jenny, why don't we start at the very beginning if we're going to focus on a year in Provence today and a bunch of other things, but let's start at the very beginning. What, what was really the, the impetus for Peter and you to move to Provence? And, what was really the impetus for Peter to, to, to write uh, a book about Provence? We had both um, spent quite a lot of time working in France, so quite separately in advertising, shooting commercials. Um, I was a producer of commercials and Peter was a, 
creative director um, and it's, we just fell in love with it independently, as I say. Um, and then we we were work we worked together, which is how we fell in love. And it was not really practical for us to stay in England because uh, I'm sad to say we were both married, and so we we left for New York and. Uh, in New York, Peter was finishing his contract with the agency, and we decided the best place to go was France. Um, and it was as, as simple as that. Um, and? And then, um, as far as the book's concerned, I mean, that was many years later, because we moved to France, um, but found we were really quite broke, um, because we were used to charging everything to expenses, like like most people in advertising. And then suddenly we were paying all the bills and there wasn't that much coming in because I had stopped working. Um, and uh, we were just dependent on royalties, um, which were pretty s slow really at the time. Um, so eventually we decided we'd better go back to England and Peter could get an agent there and, and try and um, earn some more money, which we did. And um, finally, uh, thanks to Wicked Willie, which I probably should not mention here, um, we got enough money to fulfill our dream and move to France. And that's when we arrived in, in not actually in, um, yes, it was in Manel, and that was really the first time we set up home. Um, and the book came about, I think John will probably remember, Peter had got a contract from Knopf to write a book, um, and it was going to be fiction, it was going to be his first fiction book. Um, but he was so distracted by what was going on, it was impossible. Um, I mean, I could hardly think straight most of the time, the, the sort of orchestration going on around us. Um, and he was actually having fun taking all, in all these different characters. And then eventually, um, after Abner Stein, the, Peter's agent, kept on sort of as tactfully as he could, ringing and saying, how is the book coming on? Which indeed it wasn't. Um, he said that he'd surprise us and, and would he like us to come with Sunny Meta and stay with us after the Frankfurt Book Fair, which kind of put a bit of an air of panic in the air. Um, and uh, they came and we had a wonderful weekend. And of course, a lot of wine flowed and Peter admitted that actually he hadn't really got very far. Um, but he had been making notes about all the funny things that had been going on. And every day was like a, a bit of an adventure for us. Um, and so the three of them came up with A Year in Provence. Um, to replace the, um, the book that Peter was actually contracted to write. Um, and that's how it came about. Yeah, I remember he, he had to make an adjustment. And just for, for people looking in, the reference to Wee Willie was about a series of books that Peter had written for children that had to do with body parts. And we'll leave it, we'll leave it there. <laughs> we'll leave it there. And what brought you to, to, to France in the first place, Mark? Um, well, at the age of 13, as a, as a schoolboy, still in short trousers, uh, I was uh, a mem one of the members of a, a group of schoolboys from, uh, uh, from, from, from England who went on a, an exchange visit to stay with the people of kids allegedly of our own age in uh, in France and I was just outside I was with a family in the north of Paris in one of the first of the big high-rise 15-story apartments 
And instead of having somebody my own age, I was 13, as I say, in short trousers. I was with a guy called Claude, who was over six feet tall, 15, and dreamed of being, uh, becoming a patron. And it was not a great automatic friendship, but I was just, I was just enchanted by everything about this exotic new person from the, the scent of the metro in Paris to the way they think about food and wine. And um, then through a series of happy accidents, we, uh, Julia and I found ourselves in Perigord where an old friend from journalism um, had moved with his, uh, with his wife who just inherited an old farmhouse. And so we kept on coming to visit them. And in those four and a half years that we were in Moscow, it was a wonderful time to be a journalist because it was Mikhail Gorbachev in Perestroika. But the food was unspeakably bad. So the chance of spending two weeks every summer with our friends in the Perigord was absolutely inescapable. We just had to do it. And I just became more and more fascinated and enchanted by the Perigord, which has never ended since. I still am. Just lucky, I guess. <laughs> Jenny, how did how did this great success that Peter had was Peter anticipating that kind of success? Could anyone have predicted what was going to happen with a year in Provence? The success it had in English speaking countries and all over the world was was he genuinely surprised by that success, or did he expect things were going well? Genuinely, my goodness, he was completely knocked out. He didn't. When it was about to be printed, I, I did say to him, you, you do know that there's enough in the book for people to be able to find us. And he said, that, that, that's of no consequence. He said, it, it, it won't happen. You know, there are only in England 3,000 copies. Um, and we could not believe it. No, of course not. And also, it was very, very slow to take off. Um, I think that was a lot because the booksellers didn't know where to put it. They didn't know whether it should be in a travel section, um, biography, whatever. Um, but I think uh, I think it was the recording on the BBC. They read it on the BBC, um, and from then it really started to take off. It was published first in the UK. Uh, my memory does, is failing me. Was it published first in the UK and then America? Yes, yes, it was um, uh, Sinclair. Uh, oh, that was the name of the publisher. Uh, Hamish English. Hamilton, I believe. Yeah, yeah. I remember that that when we got involved, and and to be honest with the viewers, I, I was not editors an editor of Peter's first book. I, I, I worked on all the subsequent ones, which uh, which was a delight. But uh, I remember when the book was published, and it was already making tremendous ripples in the in the UK. And now that it comes back to me, and then we just we just went to the top of the charts. It was in a it was an amazing event. How, how did it? How did you discover Peter Mail, Martin? Um, well, I remember the, the fuss that was made about the book when it came out, and um, it uh, it really became, uh, a, 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 I, I, my recollection is quite almost an instant bestseller, but I think that it what it touched upon was, look, he was a pioneer. He was the first guy who really wrote about the magic of France, not in Paris, not with the, the grand cuisine, uh, not with the, the high style, but no, he was writing about country life, about peasant life, if you like, about ordinary French food, which is very, very good, you know, it's, although it doesn't try to be stylish, and about decent local wines. And it was a different way of looking at France. And it was a way of looking at France that was timed perfectly for the way in which people were starting to take holidays and travel on their own, in their own cars, driving across the channel, down into France, staying in, suddenly finding there were these gites and there were these chambres d'hôtes that you could stay in. You didn't have to be in a grand hotel. And 
there was Peter explaining what was really special about France was not the great museums and the of, of Paris or the grand chateaus of the Loire. It was the kind of extraordinary way of life that these highly inventive people had developed for themselves, even if they weren't rich. And it was just so charming. I mean, when he was writing about, you know, about things like the, the chap hunting the truffles, I mean, that's all over France. It's not just in the Provence, it's here in the Perigord as well. And the idea of trying to teach a, a miniature Vietnamese pig to, to hunt the truffles. I mean, I, I, down in my market, you can always tell the women who are, who are trying to use pigs to catch truffles, they'll always have a finger or two missing because the, the pigs are so determined to get the truffles, they'll happily take a finger as well, um, which is why most of us use dogs, <laughs> because the dogs, don't, the dogs don't eat the truffles. Um, but all of these things, anybody who knows anything at all about France, there was just so many kicks of, of familiarity, of, of, of recognition, that it's, um, it's delightful. And, I mean, I, and he carried on. It wasn't just it wasn't just a one-off. That was um, toujours Provence is in some ways um, almost more of a favourite of mine because of all the little stories he tells, particularly the one about the policeman who was um, sacked for having caught the eye of a young woman drug smuggler and deciding he'd rather take her to bed in the airport hotel than arrest her. <laughs> <laughs> My kind of guy. <laughs> Anyway, Jenny, I wanted to ask you that was was the writing hard for Peter? Did after the figuring out between fiction and nonfiction, was the writing hard? Did he did he enjoy it? Was it something that he had to force himself to do from nine to one every day until lunch or after lunch or whatever? What was his method of writing, and and did it really give him pleasure, or was was it was it a kind of a struggle to sit at the desk every day? In answer to the first question, the, the, um, a year in Provence, he, he loved doing it. It was not difficult because this, every, every day there was so much happening that was so new and very often so funny or, or curious that, that um, he, 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 it was just flowing and he loved it. Um, and no, he, he loved writing. Um, of course, there were some days where, when he lumbered upstairs, um, I, actually not in Menerb, it was across, <laughs> his office was the other side of the swimming pool. Um, of course, there were some days when you had to be very disciplined, which indeed he was because of advertising. Um, being a copywriter in advertising, you have to be disciplined to get the work done in time and um, to ignore everything that's going on around you with the mad creative department. Um, no, he, uh, in, in the end, the last you know, six years, he wasn't well at all uh, after the first huge fall that he had. And so he was in a lot of pain and, um, but but he was it just amazed me he'd come down at lunchtime because he he always worked from nine till twelve, um, and then he'd go back in the evening and reread what he'd done. Um, but it just amazed me when he came down at lunchtime and I would read what he'd written and it it was as as light and charming and and sort of vintage male as ever. So I don't know how he pulled that out, but he did. Yeah, I, I, I remember, Jenny, that uh, in the last couple of years, it, it, it saddened me greatly because Peter was failing and, and I knew how hard it was for him to get those last couple of books done. And I also know that he had hurt his left hand. He was left handed and uh, it, it, it was just a struggle for him to write. But uh, I tell you, what a, what a wonderful run. And I, I, I you know, it's funny. Uh, what Martin just said about his uh, favorite. Did Peter have a favorite? Do you have, did you have a favorite out of all of the books? Me, of course. Yes, The Dog's Life. A Dog's uh, Life. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I was, I was about to say, after you picked your book, 
and, and, and Martin had picked his, that if the truth be told, his book on boy, your dog, boy, called A Dog's Life is my absolute favorite. Of course, I'm a dog person. And for anybody who is a dog person, uh, I recommend that book. If you, if you don't know it, uh, amidst all the books about Provence, you, you have to read that book. It's just, it's just absolutely fabulous. You know, there, there were a lot of stories at the time, Jenny, that, you know, once the book succeeded the way it had, um, your life changed, that, that not only for the, for the good, for all the success uh, that allowed you to do things you enjoyed in life, but is it true, tell me this, is it true, that one day a group of Japanese tourists either helicoptered onto your ground or knocked at your door or, or somehow wanted to see Peter, or was that a, just a myth? Not at all. Actually, the helicopter, no. Um, I don't recall that, but it was very alarming one day when a huge, um, you know, tourist bus turned up and all these Japanese climbed out and all these lovely ladies with their cameras and uh, they, they had signed on for a tour in X um, to see Peter Mayle's house and, and possibly the Abbey de Sinong, I don't know, but um, <laughs> it was certainly on the list there. And um, I mean, it was lucky he was there. Well, lucky for them he was there. Um, <laughs> many, many photographs later. <laughs> They all piled back in the bus and went on. <laughs> I, can, I can imagine that. You know, Martin, I, 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 I the house uh, and, the, and the peasant life for, for Peter and Jenny, the house um, became a, a, a kind of a fixed central point for the book. Um, your story, I know, is a little bit different. It'd be good to share it with, with uh, the viewers that how, how did you first get the idea for Bruno, Chief of Police? Well, um, we'd, since we were foreign correspondents and we were living around the world, Julio said we, we really ought to try and have some fixed point for the kids, which they could think of as home. And so we got this place in the, in the Perigord. And at first it was simply a holiday home where we'd come you know, in the summers and perhaps for Christmas. Um, but uh, I became more and more fascinated with the with the caves, the prehistoric caves of this area, and with the cave art and the and all we know about prehistory, because most of what we know about about Cro Magnon and Neanderthal people comes from this valley of the River Bazaire, where I where I now am, and uh, I produced my my first novel, which wasn't a Bruno one, it was called The Caves of Perigord, really about what kind of society could have produced Lasco. Um, and then I rather enjoyed it. And while being here, I was brought into the tennis club and the rugby club by local, by neighbours. And in the, in the clubs, I came across a really interesting fellow who was um, uh, a very keen hunter, an excellent cook, um, uh, somebody who gave up his spare time to teach the local kids to play rugby and tennis. Um, and uh, he was our village policeman. And he became my tennis partner. We became very good friends. And I thought, this guy is such a nice person, such a different kind of cop. I mean, somebody who, who realized that there's a difference between the law and justice, and he wants to support justice. I thought I'd write about him because I wanted to carry on writing about this magical area of the Perigord. So that's how it began. And then Julia, I mean, I was calling him, I was calling my hero Pierrot, which was the name of my friend. Julia said, no, you, I think you might, uh, you might, you might be able to sell this in more than one country. She said, well, you need an international name, call him Bruno. And then she said, publishers are always more interested in this series. So go away and write five short paragraphs on the next ones in the series. So I listened to Julia and I did what she said and off we went. And it's really been a bit like Peter in that, um, in that Bruno has rather, uh, the Perigord rather overtaken my life in the way that Provence rather changed your and Peter's lives, Jenny. Uh, and it's a very sweet thing to happen to you. It's one of those glorious 
accidents that sometimes takes place. I was going to say, I hope you enjoy it or enjoyed it. Oh, absolutely. How could you not? I mean, it's the, the culinary heartland of France and uh, I'm doing things that I never thought I would. I'm, I'm gardening, I'm raising chickens, I'm making my own wine. I'm hello by every time. <laughs> no, you know, it, it's, it's a, there's a lot of commonality between Martin and Peter, Jenny, but uh, I, I, it, every time I met Peter, uh, and it's very similar with Martin, is, is the genuine enjoyment of their lives. I, I, you know, I would get these letters from Peter and, and I just, the joy and the pleasure that life gave him every day, living the way you were living, um, finding your own privacy. Uh, he, he, he was such a gent. And I, I remember in New York, you know, Martin nowadays, when we, when we do events and bookstores, they, just more and more bookstores want to have Martin and they, they, they always want to have him back. I remember when Peters uh, was at the height of his success, we went to a bookstore in, in the west part of Greenwich Village in New York. I think it was Rizzoli's. The line was around the block. He was like a rock star. And, and we were supposed to be out of there in about an hour and a half. And he signed two books, three books, four books for each person. And we were so late to dinner, we had to call up the restaurant and ask them to please stay open. Uh, how did, I know you lived in several areas of Provence, Jenny. How, what, what made you move from, from place to place? Um, we didn't really have too much choice because it really was getting so difficult with people knew where the house was and there was a track behind the house the mountains went up the Luberon and that was for people to walk and bicycle and they started coming down from there to the back of the house um we we really didn't have any privacy and we'd come home from lunch or something and actually one time we came home and we found a note to say these people had been there and they were sorry they'd missed us but we, they had to tell us that there was a rat on the table in the in the garden. I, I thought that was charming that they felt it necessary to let us know. <laughs> America, and also because Peter's children, most of them were in in America, so we decided to move there. Did you stay? Did you live sort of to yourself, or? Did you become part of the communities? I, I always, I, I remember once visiting you and I met Peter uh, at a cafe in the village, which was very, far, very walking distance from where you live. And he was sitting at a table. It was just before noon. He had a glass of rosé and a cigarette in his hand. And it's like he knew everybody in the village, or at least it seemed that way. W was that the way it was? Or was it just a kind of a, just so happy to be there, a, a joviality in him? Oh, no. And I mean, we did, they were so welcoming. Everybody was lovely. That That's in Lormoran later. Um, yeah, I mentioned yeah. It was different because it was so much earlier and they were very wary of strangers. And Peter hadn't written the book by then or anything. Um, and you always had the feeling with Manab that um, as you walked through, there were people behind the curtain, you know, working out that there were the foreigners again. But by the time we came back from America to Lormoran, um, they, they just welcomed us with open, ar open arms and it, it was so nice. And it is so yeah. nice. I mean, and that's also why I stayed here. So many people said to me when Peter died, oh, you're going to go back to England, aren't you? And I couldn't believe it. And I said, why would I? Um, <laughs> That's so nice. Um, they, they have such a sense of um, protocol. They, uh, you know, in the beginning, nobody overwhelmed me or anything. They, they were just very um, charming and wishing me good morning and was I all right? Um, and the other thing about them is that, that, you know, I know when, if I feel depressed, I can just go down there and sit in a cafe. 
have a cup of coffee and enough people will come by and ask me how I am, but, but not say, will you come to dinner? Will you come to lunch? Or, which, which frightens me to death. Um, they, they're just lovely people. And um, yeah. it's my home. It's, it's, there's just a tremendous undeniable charm in your area. And I, I remember, I, I just, there's a magic about it. I, I know uh, Martin and I, you know, we li I live in the Southwest of France. Martin lives a little bit North of me. And, you know, I'm very fond of this place. And I, I know Martin loves the Perigo and with reason. Uh, Provence though is a magical place. You know, I, I, I want to, mention one thing that just to get it on the record I've always wanted to say this in public when that BBC series came out of a year in Provence with a very good actor but a man named John Tho who became a successful very successful with Inspector Morse was it I think years later when I saw that BBC show and this portrayal this portrayal of Peter Mail as some kind of an arrogant, elitist man. I wanted to throw something at the television set. Peter was, it, it just failed to depict anything about Peter. Peter was one of the most wonderful guys to be around, the most generous guy, the most fun person to be with. And the former publisher of Sunny Meta, who was a wonderful man himself and a great friend of Peter's, uh, once said to me, you know, Peter is one of the great gents in the world. And, and that, those are the words that I always, always remember. Now, Martin, you're a good person too. I don't mean to, I don't mean to diminish it. And, when, and with you, we have a lot of fun together too. I just wanted to ask you, is, there, is the writing experience for you similar to the way it was for, for Peter? It's hard to um, so me writing has, um, has really been something I've all my life. I've, I've been a journalist for 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 so a journalist for so long, for a daily newspaper, which meant writing something like a thousand words at least per day, sometimes a lot more than that. And um, you know, when something big was happening, whether it be in Washington or in in in, in Moscow, I'd be writing along as well. So I was just accustomed always to getting a lot down on paper and so that's how i've always thought about about writing and i get a, i get rather confused when people say to me well don't you have trouble how do you write dialogue i mean how do you think about the way people write that so i it's like in journalism you just write down quotes da -da 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 -da, close quotes he said or she said um I mean, I, I've, I've never over-intellectualized it. I mean, it's just, it's just you're telling a story, you're entertaining yourself and people if you're lucky. And um, I, I mean, frankly, you know, I'm not writing War and Peace here, nor was Peter. We're, we're, writing, uh, we're writing fiction or, 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 sem or semi-autobiography in a way that we hope amuses people, entertains them, and we don't have any grandiose, um, I don't have any grandiose ideas about that. And I'm sure Peter didn't matter. And that's one reason why it worked, because there was never anything really pompous about what Peter was writing. And I, I have a particular fondness for some other of his books, which are Kippert stories. Those, those novels about, about, uh, about kinds of almost crimes or but always a bit sort of a bit of honesty and decency and um, I just found those very entertaining and amusing and that's what that's what we do we we write in I think rather similar kinds of light-hearted ways yeah I, I and I the, the pleasure in your books the, the the just sheer enjoyment you pick them up and you don't want to put them down Jenny could you tell those of us who who are here that that the story about a good year you know, it was, uh, Martin reminds me of, of, of the novels and uh, A Good Year was, was so much fun. And I, I, I remember feeling that you and Peter at the beginning of the book when the main character leaves London because of the horrid weather, you know, I felt you probably were chuckling to yourself when, when you're looking out the window at beautiful Provence. Can you tell us a little bit of, of the story about 
how that book came to be and how the film came to be? Um, actually, the book came to be because of Ridley. Um, he, we were friends with Ridley because he was a- Ridley director. Scott, yeah. Sorry, yeah, Ridley Scott. He was a, he had a commercial company in London, practically opposite mine in Beak Street in Soho, which was rather bizarre. And um, he, so after we'd all left advertising many years later, we found that he had a house here about an hour from us and we got together. And um, then a, a, about a year later, he, he called Peter up and he said he'd taken a, a cutting out of a paper and um, he, thought it might set something off for Peter and could we get together? So we got, they got together and um, Peter wrote a good year. Um, the only, I, it was a beautiful film. I think it's a shame because there was a whole nother story in the book that there wasn't a place for in the film. Um, so do read it, please. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, it was a great uh, coming together. They're both uh, both admirers of each other. It, it, it was a very good uh, working relationship. I I loved that scene in the film where they're playing cricket indoors in the long corridor, which oh. is a very a very English, very British scene. I think. Yes. I often wondered what Americans thought of it. Yes, indeed. Funny enough, one night, um, actually Peter was ill and it was one of the last times we were in London and we were in, in this, staying in the hotel opposite where the uh, Teji Vegas from, I can't think what it's called, but anyway, there were just the two of us, but at the next door table, we couldn't help getting involved because they were quite loud and the fellow was immensely funny. And um, eventually we started talking together and then we had some more drinks. And it ended up with this fellow had played for rugby for England at one time. And it ended up with them playing cricket with a, a rolled up napkin in the corridor leading to the, to the restaurant. And it was the happiest I've seen Peter for a long time. It was a very good evening. <laughs> I'm glad he was happy, Jenny um, and Martin. I'm, I'm getting some questions from the audience and I'm gonna ask some of the questions that they've given to me. Jenny, uh, were you as relaxed as you seemed during the work that was done on your house in a year in Provence? You always seemed to graciously adapt to whatever circumstances came your way. I'm sure that was Peter being his gentlemanly self. <laughs> I don't think I was really. Um, though he's very, very charming in the way he portrayed me, but I, I think I'm coming, my afterlife, I'm coming back to learn patience. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was. It was fun, but it was difficult. Um, and, but in the end, actually, you know, the guys were so nice that Didier, who was the, the main man moving the table in the courtyard, um, his, his, I waited, his dog came to breakfast every morning with our dogs. And um, Didier got used to me in, in, in my dressing gown or whatever, because I couldn't be ready every day to present myself at, at 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> Um, but no, it was. It, of course, it gets rosier from a distance, but it, it was quite difficult sometimes. Uh, here's another question for both of you: uh, What do Martin and Jenny think are the most underappreciated parts of France, geographically or culturally? Well, I, I, I think the Perigord is is undervalued by many French people. I mean, I, the Perigord is a much older part of, uh, part of the country than, than, than 
than it's older than France. The Perigords had a distinct identity for thousands of years, long before Julius Caesar turned up, long before there was any such thing as the French state with its own, and it had its own language, its own culture, its own traditions. And that's the same in Provence, I think, as well, because Provence was a um, was a, a very different kind of culture from the northern France. And you have Provençal as your own language there. And, uh... Yes, it was, um, I mean, it's got an enormous history and, and wealth of culture from having the popes in Avignon, apart from anything else. But I, the question I think was for the most, uh, the place that hasn't been discovered. And I can't really answer that because although when we came here, we decided we didn't need to go anywhere else abroad, that there were so many places in France we wanted to find and discover and have adventures. Um, but we never really did that. We were always here or we'd go to Paris just for a couple of days. And, and I, I say a couple of days because literally Peter couldn't deal with any more than that. He wanted to go home always. Uh, and I did find the lot was wonderful and and it still seemed although i haven't been for probably five years it was certainly underdeveloped and um i thought a wonderful region i, I live in the lot uh, jenny as you might remember and i live about 30 kilometers west of cahors and it is still an extremely underdeveloped uh, and very natural part of France. The, the business is here are primarily agricultural. Uh, the wine business is very, very uh, active. They've, they've developed rosés down here that are extremely good. But uh, I, I think the lot is a good candidate if, if I were asked. I, I have a question for Jenny that, you know, I should have asked this earlier. Of course, the book came out in English. And then it was many years, translated in many, 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 many countries and many languages. When people, either English or French, the a French edition I think was published many years later, if I remember, but it-, it French edition. Yeah, what was, the, what was the local reaction from people as, in terms of the book? That's a question I have from the audience. The reason that it wasn't published for a long time was because um, the powers that be, the publishers, of, thought that it wouldn't go down very well, that, they, that um, they would think Peter was making fun of the locals. Um, and then we were at dinner one night um, with, with a publisher. Uh, actually, that was sort of Incidentally, we were there for, because we knew the son, actually, and his mother was a publisher, and um, she, he was the one who suggested why shouldn't it be translated, and we we wondered also because we knew that it it came out of love, affection for the people of Provence. Peter was not making caricatures, not at all. And if people had come down here and read the book, they would see that. Um, and actually, it was it it, it was um, a great success. I think um, there was just one, possibly a couple of other people from letters we got, um, but there was one person living in Manerbe who made it his business to. Uh, Bad mouth Peter, that's the only way I can put it. Um, and was going on television in England um, saying, you know, that, that it wasn't at all like Peter said, and um, Peter was really making fun of everybody. But it, it sold, and lots of French people write. And indeed, I still get letters from French people. And they want to know why his last book has not been translated. That I can't answer, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's not sure. I'm not sure I can either, but you know, there's a question from, from a, a viewer asking that 
when, when Peter turned to fiction with Hotel Pastis, which was also a great success, was that the book he set out to write at the beginning or, or was that a totally different idea? Um, actually, no, the first one was, uh, oh no, of course it was, sorry. No, it was Hotel Pastis, um, which I love. I really love that book. Um, yeah, um, we loved your soaps, your La Sorbe, and um, the, the idea came to him. At that time, the weekends were wonderful because the roads were just covered with cyclists. Um, it was such a sport at that time. Um, and he had this idea watching this marvelous bank on a little island in, in the river, in the Sorg. Um, that that would be the, the, the getaway, would, the bank would be the one to be attacked through the water, um, through a passage underwater, and that they would get away on market day, Sunday, on bicycles, because nobody could possibly follow them. Um, and, and that's how it all came about. <laughs> it's fascinating. Uh, a reader, uh, a viewer rather, is asking, uh, did, did Peter choose the translators of his work ever, or what was that left to the publishers? Do you remember? Um, I, I think that it was Knopf who found the, the um, translator, um, and I, I'm so ashamed, I can't think of his name, but he, he became friends, with, we never met, but he became friends with Peter, Peter trusted him totally. And when there was something that was really curious, um, he would call up and say, now help me here. How can I translate this? Um, so it, it was the publisher originally who presented him. Um, and then as I say, they just fitted a like hand in glove and it worked very well. As, as for the other countries, um, that was, um, he, he did a lot of, but I mean, Japanese with, and Korean. Yeah, you, and, couldn't have, you couldn't have helped very much there. <laughs> any of that. You know, I, I, wanna, I wanna go back to Martin for one second and then I'd like to come back to you, Jenny, but here's a question from the audience, Martin. Uh, I am surprised by the amount of contemporary French history that I have learned from reading the Bruno series. Did you think that you would be educating people across the world about the contemporary history from the French point of view when you included those parts? Or was it just backstory for Bruno and the other characters? It was what I was educating people and it wasn't just backstory. It was my own real interest in all this stuff. Um, I mean, I've been fascinated to find out more and more um, about French history. When I first got here, there were still some people around who had been, who had been resistance uh, veterans in, the, in World War II. And I went around and I interviewed quite a few of them um, and got to learn more and more about that particular phase of the war, which I'd never fully, which I had never studied in any organized sense, although I'd, I'd read history at university. And then I, the fascination I had, the growing fascination with the, with the caves, the Neanderthals, the Cro-Magnon people, the prehistory, all of that was fascinating and the role of the Romans and, um, and then the, 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 the waves of invasions that kept coming through, the Goths, the Franks, the Arabs coming up from Spain, the Vikings, the English, it never stopped. And I, uh, I became more and more fascinated by this whole this whole panoply of French history and how much of it is focused right here in the Perigord. And uh, so for that reason, I, it wasn't just trying to give it a bit of verisimilitude. I was genuinely interested in all of that because the whole point about crime is that the past, as Faulkner said, the past is never really past. An awful lot of, 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 of crimes get solved because people, detectives dive back into the history of the individuals who are victims or whatever. It's uh, the past lives on. Do you, I, I wanna ask you this and I'm gonna ask Jenny the same question. 
do you prefer writing fiction now more than nonfiction? No, I like writing both. Um, I really do. And I, I find it, it likes, it's exercising a different muscle. And something else that I do, I write, I write quite a lot about wine. I write columns about wine for um, a local Anglophone paper and also for a German magazine. And I really enjoy doing that. I, I love the whole business of visiting the vineyards and being on juries for, 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 for wines and indeed making my own wine or at least blending it in the classical way. So I, I just, I, I love doing things that I never thought I would do. I read a lot of French history, being a member of a local history club, so we go back into medieval documents, learning about winemaking. I love all this stuff. I mean, it's, it's just things are new every day. <laughs> Jenny, did, did Peter make a conscious decision at one time that he just wanted, that he had said what he wanted to say in nonfiction and he wanted to turn to fiction? Um, no, he just, he, he, I don't think he ever thought he'd said all he wanted to say about Provence and the people here. He just, um, he loved the idea of doing fiction because it, you weren't so restricted as you were, as when you're, um, it, it, the books had the same warmth and the, they had the same warmth and they had the same tone. Uh, I just wondered if he made a con And of course, uh, at the end, he returned to nonfiction uh, with 25 years in Provence, which I, I, I recommend to all our listeners and viewers. It has a, a legiac tone to it. It has a, it has a, a very, very touching tone uh, by a man who was grateful for his life and grateful for the place he lived and, and his family and the way he was able to in, get so much enjoyment from, from, a, from a place and the people in it and the way it looked. I, I remember him telling me once uh, the joy of going uh, on walks with the dogs through the Provence landscape was just so meaningful to him and you could, you could read it in his face. Now, um, as we're getting to the end of this, I would like to taunt the readers and the, and the viewers by saying, what's your favorite Provencal meal, Jenny? My favorite Provencal meal? I, I'm sorry, but it, because it's so ordinary, but I just love lamb, the sister on lamb. I don't eat meat actually anymore, but I eat lamb. <laughs> <laughs> And it would be hard, Martin, living in the Perigord, not to eat meat, right? Absolutely. But uh, one of the things, I, one of the stories of, of Peter's that I really remember with great affection is when he describes a night out to listen to poverty in the Roman amphitheater in Orange. And Somebody says the reason that he's carrying this enormous white handkerchief, Pavarotti, is because it's a, it's a napkin. And he's going back between areas to have another course of some monumental great dish. And Peter is dreaming up what the menu is going to be. And then for, the, for his encore, Pavarotti come back wearing a great big long scarf. And somebody who's with you on that event says, ah, he must have spilt some of the sauce on his white waistcoat and he's wearing the scarf to hide it. I thought it was a lovely story. <laughs> What are you having for dinner tonight? What am I having for dinner tonight? I am going to, uh, to have dinner. I'm having um, I'm having veal with some uh, with some with some neighbours a blanquette de veau, which is a classic way of, of of making a kind of a white dish out of what has to be if it's real veal a very white kind of meat. So I mean I like Jenny I have a great fondness and affection for lamb but equally for very, very good veal. And um, I couldn't imagine, I don't eat that much meat, I eat less and less all the time, but I couldn't do without it really. Could I just tell you that um, this morning I was roasting a chicken because I knew it would be late tonight and I wouldn't feel after I'd walked the dog, I wouldn't feel like cooking. The dog has just walked in, oh my God. Yes, she's been in a pond which is full of green clay, are she? <laughs> um, anyway, so I'm 
cooking and I was cooking some vegetables as well for her, for the dog <laughs> and for me. And I was also playing um, A Year in Provence. I was listening to it all the time. And this was for supper, the chicken was for supper. But you know, I had to have it for lunch because Peter had made me so hungry through all, <laughs> all the meals that he talked about. <laughs> and so I had my supper at lunchtime. No, it, 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 you know, one of the joys, it just can't be <clears throat> overstated is, I mean, you're such a good cook and Martin and his wife are, are such good cooks, but the, the fresh ingredients, the, the use of herbs, the, 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 the love that people put into their food, it's just, it's, it's a remarkable enriching way of life. And it's not a question of whether you eat fish or if you, you don't, you know, if you only eat vegetables, if you, I mean, what's better than ratatouille on a, on a, on a given night? It's, it's the richness of the food is so much a part of Provence. It was so much a part of, of your and, and Peter's life. Um, it's such a big part of Martin's books, you know, they're, you know, we're, we're even going to do a cookbook of, <laughs> of all the recipes that, that appear in, in Martin's book and, and that'll be out uh, in, a, in about a year. Uh, it's, it, it's a, when I was thinking back of our getting together today, uh, I have to tell you both, I've had such wonderful memories uh, of Peter, of meals we had in New York and a, a meal once at, uh, in Paris. Uh, the joy that, that Peter brought to so many people's lives and uh, the joy that he found in, in doing the work he did and, and all the rest of it. And, and you know, it's, it, it may be unfair or improper to say, but there's a tradition and Martin is, is now carrying on that tradition. These are, these are books that do a lot for cultural life uh, to, to introduce aspects of France to people all around the world because Martin's books are translated quite a bit as well. And I think it's a, it's a major culture, cultural contribution that, that both Peter and, and uh, Martin have made to the world. And uh, uh, it's just been a great pleasure to be with, with both of you tonight. And I, I can't thank you enough because it made this a great night for me as well. And I hope it made it a great night for our, our viewers and listeners. And, Good night to you both, because we're it's dinner time here in here in France. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, John. Thank you. It was a great pleasure to meet you and to see you again, John. God bless. Take care of yourself and Martin. I'll, I'll be seeing you soon. I hope before I go back to the states. Look forward. God bless to both of you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you three so much for doing this. Bye-bye. A great pleasure. Bye-bye.